page to stage. Some of these sick brothers need some help fast forward. The movie they live in is backwards. Take them to the hood and listen to some black words. Brown words, red words, yellow words, blue words, new words. Make them understand that the pain is true words. Let them read Langston, Dunbar, Haley on Red. Make them understand step and fetch is dead. Get them on a new page, deal with the old rage sinner. Oh. We want to dedicate this poem to three people. Archbishop Romero from El Salvador. A great lady poet named Carolyn Forche. And of course, Martin Luther King. And all people who plant seeds. He said, I have a dream, but it shattered, shot, earth, earth, shot right through the earth, while a beating heart needs comforting. This is called old, old, wise, wise corn planted, growing branches of understanding beauty, a quarter moon shimmering on branches, moon shine up the tree trunk, flowing river, flowing through a boulder gateway and flowing towards reflection of the moon, of the moon. A reflection that split by the canoe. Trees, trees, they paint his face, paint his face. A low hanging branch over long braided hair like a headdress of leaves. Old wise corn, he tears off a leaf, a row of kernels. Then he husks the whole corn, rows, rows of kernels. A yellow seed. It explodes into life. The flower cup, its center, a swirling fugue. This seed will build a bridge from one bank to the other, a suspension bridge, and then rising from the ground, a church, steeple, bell, bell, doors, doors, opening to a black congregation by ones, twos, threes, and fours, singing hallelujah and marching, marching with determination. They face the river, the bridge, and they face the black boots, the belt tightened, the thick protective coat, fireman's hat, Fire hose, lines powered on, it's a water cannon. But they march anyways. The firemen, with a jet stream, he smashes him and blows him away. I said he smashes his face and blows him away. And then the fireman blows him away. Water pounding, forming chains of water that drain off of this black man. And then he blows away marchers, just blows him away in a hurricane of rage that chains him. Then he blasts another. His shoes go flying off, 
and the fire hose drags him down the street, smashed on a storefront. This raging stream of images is captured on NBC, where it's transmitted up, up, up to the satellite, and then down, down, down to the antenna of a house, into the wiring, and down to the television set where you sit watching as the fire hose drags him down the street, smashed. This image is a shot of knowledge that goes from your head down, down to your heart, a heart that needs comforting. Thank you. I'm going to read a sound poem first, even though it's not on a bill. I just got to get my head together running through the rain with asthma. So bear with me a second. I go, I go, I go, I go. I go, I go, I go, um, I go, I go, um, I go, I go, um, I go, 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 I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'm, I'm going, I'll go, I'm going, 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 I saw my husband today. Odd, I'm ringless but shopping for whole wheat and onion potato pierogies in the organic frozen food section of the health food store. Everyone said it was the condensation on the door, the sigh of my breath, considering past romantic disappointments, gliding solitary down the aisle, but no. I saw the outline of his locks and skin like a photo negative, the luscious panorama of tofu, cream cheese, soy sausage, and rice milk shimmering on the other side. The hairs on my arms raised and a shiver went through me as I recognized an old friend. Some things you just know. I saw him again for a flash on the manager's face who asked me to stop opening and closing the door. He said, there are Polish health food nuts here, lady, and Russians too. They have just as much a right, if not more, to pierogies than you. I'd wait a few minutes, let the crystals build on the glass, another vision, a new angle to his face. If only I'd had more hands, a, a couple more minutes, I could have made a flip book from the wall of glass entries to the iced food. Oh well. I pick up the sweaty cardboard box of treats as my cart is wheeled away. I have a hint. I'm still glassy-eyed, holding on to his beautific face. Thank you. Our next poet is our national treasure, Galway Cannell. Uh, good evening. I'm very happy to be here at this uh, People's Poetry Gathering and to be mingled among poets of all kinds, all schools, all sizes, all ages, uh, who live by the written word, the spoken word, the sung word, the performed poem, and to find that poetry is uh, in all of them, and it brings all of us together. The poet that came to mind when I thought the, uh, this afternoon, who brings together in um, his person the oral and the literary tradition, or the written tradition, 
Um, the name that popped into mind was, D. A. It was uh, Dylan Thomas, in whom I hear the Welsh bard singing when he's reading his poems. So I'm going to recite a poem of his, or read it if necessary. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. Thank you. Now I'll uh, conclude with a poem of my own, a poem that um, came to me actually so fast that I don't think of myself as having written it, but of simply, uh, as, but as simply uh, as having written it down. It's called The Bear. In late winter, I sometimes glimpse bits of steam coming up from some fault in the old snow and bend close and see it is lung colored and put down my nose and know the chilly, enduring odor of bear. I take a wolf's rib and whittle it sharp at both ends and coil it up and freeze it in blubber and place it out on the fairway of the bears. And when it has vanished, I move out on the bear tracks, roaming in circles until I come to the first tentative dark splash on the earth. And I set out running, following the splashes of blood wandering over the world. At the cut, gashed resting places, I stop and rest. At the crawl marks where he lay out on his belly to overpass some stretch of bochy ice, I lie out, dragging myself, myself forward with bare knives in my fists. On the third day, I begin to starve. At nightfall, I bend down as I knew I would at a turd sopped in blood and hesitate and pick it up and thrust it in my mouth and gnash it down and go on running. On the seventh day, living by now on bare blood alone, I can see his upturned carcass far out ahead, a scraggled, steamy hulk, the, the dismayed face, sorry, a, a, a scraggled, steamy hulk, the heavy fur riffling in the wind. I come up to him and stare at the narrow spaced petty eyes, the dismayed face laid back on a shoulder, the nostrils flared, catching perhaps the first taint of me as he died. I hack a ravine in his thigh and eat and drink and tear him down his whole length and open him and climb in and close him up after me against the wind and sleep and dream of lumbering flat-footed over the tundra, stabbed twice from within, splattering a trail behind me, splattering it out no matter which way I lurch, which dance of solitude I attempt, which gravity-clutched leap, which trudge, which groan, until one day I totter and fall, fall on this stomach that has tried so hard to keep up, to digest the blood as it leaked in, to break up and digest the bone itself. And now the breeze blows over me, blows off the hideous belches of ill-digested bear blood and rotted stomach and the ordinary wretched odor of bear, blows across my sore, lulled tongue a song or screech until I think I must rise up and dance 
and I lie still. I awaken, I think. Marsh lights reappear. Geese come trailing again up the flyway. In her ravine under old snow, the dam bear lies licking lumps of smeared fur and drizzly eyes into shapes with her tongue. And one hairy-souled trudge stuck out before me, the next groaned out, the next, the next. The rest of my days I spend wandering, wondering what anyway was that sticky infusion, that rank flavor of blood, that poetry by which I lived. Thank you. Stanley has done the unprecedented thing of writing into his 10th decade, a period of life previously unexpressed by poetry. Other pro poets have written almost as far. Thomas Hardy wrote till he was 88, Michelangelo till he was 89, Sophocles till he was 90. Now Stanley breaks from the pack alone. <laughs> Stanley has been a kind of father for, and I was going to say uh, poets younger than he, but that of course means all poets. Uh, and we have our birth families, but um, we also have the second family in poetry that helps us sing the first family, as well as sing the strangers, friends, and beloveds, and the spurned earth and its creatures. Stanley is the star to every wandering bark for poets and for all his readers. What makes the engine go, he writes, desire, desire, desire. I'm going to present you Stanley Kunitz who, and uh, say, we who are young will never see so much nor live so long. Stanley. First of all, thank you, Galway. I must tell you in the audience that Galway and I are brothers in spirit and for the human spirit. And we believe, as William Blake did, that in the kingdom of heaven, all souls are equal and it is so with poets. Whenever I leaf through the pages of my collected poems, as I did a few hours ago, I experience the curious sensation of watching a panorama unfold not only the recognizable scenes of one man's life in its passing, but in the background, the grander panorama of this fateful past 20th century itself, through nearly all of which I have managed, God knows how, to wind my way. It took me more than 50 years to write the poem I'm going to read to you next. It took me 50 years to pluck up the courage to write it. The Portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself especially at such an awkward time and in a public park 
that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with the pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek still burning. This next is a prose poem, and I think it's self-explanatory. It's called The Old Darned Man. Back in the 30s, in the midst of the Great Depression, I fled the city and moved to a Connecticut farm. It was the period of my first marriage. We lived in an old gambrel house built about 1740 on top of a ridge called Wormwood Hill. I had bought the house together with more than a hundred acres of woodland and pasture for $500 down. It had no electricity, no heat, no running water, and it was in bad repair, but it was a great, beautiful house. I spent most of three years working with my hands, making it habitable. At that time, early American art and furniture were practically being given away. Poor as we were, we managed to fill the house with priceless stuff. We were so far from the city and from all signs of progress that we might as well have been living in another age. One spring, there appeared on the road, climbing up the hill, a man in a patchwork suit with a battered silk hat on his head. His trousers and swallow-tailed coat had been mended so many times with very colored swatches that when he approached us over the brow of the hill, he looked like a crazy quilt on sticks. He was an itinerant tinker, dried out and old, thin as a scarecrow, with a high cracked voice. He asked for pots and pans to repair, scissors and knives to sharpen. In the shade of the sugar maples that a colonel in Washington's army was said to have planted, he set up his shop and silently went to work on the articles I handed to him. When he was done, I offered him lunch in the kitchen. He would not sit down to eat, but accepted some food in a bag. I have been here before, he said to me quietly. On our way out, while we were standing in the front hall, at the foot of the staircase, he suddenly cried, I hear the worms tumbling in this house. What do you mean, I asked. He did not answer, but cupped his hands over his eyes. I took it as a bad omen, a fateful <laughs> prophecy about my house, my marriage, 
and so it turned out to be. <laughs> Some time later, I learned that my visitor was a legendary figure known throughout the countryside as the old darned man. He had been a brilliant divinity student at Yale, engaged to a childhood sweetheart with the wedding set for the day after graduation. But on that very day, while he waited at the church, the news was brought to him that she had run off with his dearest friend. Ever since then, he had been wandering distractedly from village to village in his wedding clothes. As for the worms, they belong to a forgotten page in local history. Late in the 19th century, the housewives of the region, dreaming of a fortune to be made, had started a cottage industry in silkworm culture, importing the worms from China. The par 